tonight for the opportunity to be here in Meridian, to be home. I'm grateful to be able to share about Jesus, share about your word, uh, about prophecy. And Lord, I always like to acknowledge that I, I have nothing to give. And so I'm praying that your spirit and presence will be with us here tonight as we open your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we ended last night in Daniel chapter 2. And we saw that Jesus, symbolized by that great rock, if you remember in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 and 45, right in there, said this rock would come, it would strike that great image in Daniel chapter 2, and it would destroy it, and it would destroy all earthly kingdoms. It was symbolic of Jesus coming, wiping out earthly kingdoms, and setting up His kingdom once and for all. And so the question we want to begin with tonight is when. And we can look around us and we can see that this earth is undergoing a major crisis. I mean, this is something we're in a time like we have never lived in before, I think. We are unprecedented amounts of tornadoes and earthquakes and tsunamis and floods and droughts and fires and all these things going on. Gas prices are soaring. Uh, the food prices are soaring where you can even find food, right? Uh, looks like we're headed into a recession and we've got the coronavirus that has really destabilized the entire world over the last couple of years. And it looks like we could possibly be on the brink of World War III. There's something different. If you're awake, you know there's something different going on on this planet than we've ever experienced before. Things seem to be pointing to a climax of unprecedented proportions. And whether you are a Bible believer or not... With the shape of our world and society that we're living in right now, people have to wonder, where are we at in the grand scheme of things tonight? Where are we at? Surely, most people think we can't keep going on. I mean, anybody with a brain, right, could, could see we can't keep going like we're going right now. And, of course, the hope for the Bible-believing Christian is the second coming of Jesus. The Bible calls it the blessed hope over in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And if you'll see, I have that number 828 in parentheses. That's where you can find that in that seminar Bible. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the hope of the Christian. That is what's going to bring relief to this world. You might have heard of Dwight Moody. He once did a study on, uh, of the Bible to find out how often it spoke of the second coming of Jesus. And his conclusions, he says it comes to over 2,500 times that the Bible refers to the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of, of Christ is a major theme in the book of Revelation, whether you realize that or not. Look at the following text with me quickly. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to go through them very quickly. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye will see him, the coming of Jesus. Revelation 3, 11, Behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 12, And behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, verse 20, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. So from the first chapter in the book of Revelation to the last chapter in the book of Revelation, it, this book speaks over and over about the return of Christ. And so tonight, as we look at some of the prophecies that point to the end time, we're going to see without a shadow of a doubt that the end is not just near, the end is here, I believe. Speaking about the end of the world, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. If you want to go to Matthew chapter 24 and hold your place there, we're going to be there a lot tonight. Matthew chapter 24, uh, page 30, uh, verse 36, page 683. Jesus says, but of that day and hour, he's referring to his second coming, uh, uh, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So I, what I want to do is kind of let you know right off the bat that I am not going to try and put a date on the second coming of Jesus. Jesus said nobody knows that. So I don't pretend to know that from up here, okay? But I do believe, and as we'll see from Scripture, that we can know it's very near. It's very near. I've got a magazine here on the second, about the second coming of Jesus, and it goes through repeated all these different attempts where people predicted the second coming of Jesus, all the way from 2800 B.C., before Jesus came, all the way down to 2415, over and over and over, these different people who predicted the second coming of Jesus was going to occur on this year or that year. We don't know for sure, but we do know it's very near. Look in Matthew, beginning in verse 30, chapter 24, verse 30. 
It says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So there's that second coming Jesus is referring to, verse 31. He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. He says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Verse 33, so you also, when you shall see all what? What's the next two words? These things know that it's near at the doors. Tonight, friends, when we go through some of these signs of Jesus' return, you're going to know, I believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we are on the countdown to the very end of time. Jesus said that, if, that you're smart enough to tell when summer is near, when you look at things like the fig tree turning green, etc. He said, now when you see, if you can do that, he said, when you see these things that we're about to read about, he says, you can know that my coming is near. He didn't say you'll know exactly when it's going to be. He didn't so, say you'll be able to put a date on the calendar. But he said, you will know it's very near. And early in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus and his disciples, they're walking, and they're walking past the temple and the, the disciples, they point out the temple of Jesus when you back up in Matthew chapter 24. And they point out how grand, how magnificent the temple is. And Jesus says, it's going to be completely destroyed. It's going to be wiped out. Not one stone is going to be left upon one another. And so the disciples, in their confusion, they were upset. They thought, you know, this can't be. They said, the, the temple, that's, that's God's place of worship. And so they asked a question. Verse 3, Matthew 24, verse 3 says this, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, this is after Jesus tells them this whole place is going to be wiped out. He says, tell us, the disciples say to Jesus, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They were associated the destruction of the temple with the coming of Jesus. You know, they're saying, Lord, if the temple falls, that must mean that the end has come. It must mean that you're about to set up your kingdom on this earth. So we want to know when that's going to happen. So listen carefully now to what Jesus says next. He's going to begin to tell us what these things are that we just referred, that he just referred to. Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one does what? Deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you. This is a very important concept to understand, especially living in the time that we do right now. It is a key concept we're going to see in Bible prophecy. You're going to see that, that, that idea of deception coming up over and over again. You'll, you'll see that, that theme keep popping up. But God says that before Jesus comes, there's going to be a lot of confusion in this world, and you and I are going to have to be very, very careful. We want to be sure we know what God has to say, and we don't need to let anyone deceive us. Why? Look in verse 5 and 6 of Matthew 24. Jesus said, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Verse 6 you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Jesus said there's going to be people coming in his name. They would deceive lots of people. And that's why I keep telling you, don't trust me. Study, back up what I'm saying by the word. I don't want you to believe everything I say. Study it. He says, he went on to say, verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines pestilences and earthquakes in various places. So in other words, Lord, when, when are you going to return? How we know? What are these things? What are these signs you're talking about? He said, you're going to know when it's close, Jesus says. He says, watch for these things. Watch for false Christ. Watch for increase in wars. Watch for famine. Watch for pestilences. Watch for earthquakes, he says. And then watch out because you will know then it's almost time for me to come. Over the last decade or so, these signs have accelerated to the point where they are occurring in rapid sequence. Listen again in verse 5. He said, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, I want you to notice that word again. He says deceive or deception. How many people will be deceived by, the, by these false Christ? How many did he say? Many. He said it again in verse 24. 
false, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. There's that dis- word deceive again. It's one of the biggest themes, again, in Bible prophecy. And the warning is clear. We need to know where we stand. Uh, there's a moment coming, there's a time coming, when you won't even be able to trust the evidence of your senses, of your eyes. You've got to, under- you've got to be so grounded in the Word of God and in Jesus that you, you won't fall for these things. There's a lot of miracles that are going to be taking place in the wrong place, a lot of false miracles. Notice a couple of texts with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15 says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. You notice what he said? Satan will be transformed into an angel of light, and his ministers are like the, 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 those fallen angels, which we'll talk about on another night. They'll be transformed into ministers of righteousness. Look at Revelation 13, verse 13. It says, He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. More, more miracles. It doesn't say this is a false miracle. It says it's a miracle, and we'll talk about this on, on another night. Verse 14 of the same chapter. He deceives those, there's that word again, who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Now look at Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. It says, For they are spirits of demons, doing what, does it say? Performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. There it is again, the demons performing signs, doing miracles. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says, So the great dragon, uh, and it explains, if you're wondering Bible prophecy who the great dragon is, it tells us right after that, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceived some people over in Collinsville, Mississippi. Who, what is it, who's de- deceived, does it say? The whole world is deceived. That ought to catch your attention. It, tomorrow night, you need to be here. It says, but he deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That means somehow, brothers and sisters, are you included in the whole world? Yeah, I am too, right? So somehow, we're going to be included in this deception. That's why we got to have our ears wide open. That's why you can't just believe any preacher standing in a pulpit that you don't know. And I don't keep saying this so you don't believe anything I say, so don't get me wrong. You're going, well, I'm leaving, I'm never going back. But, but I'm just saying be very careful. Study these things. Deception is one of the most vital parts of Satan's plan because that's one thing that God will not do. God will not lie. We're going to see this more and more in some of the coming nights. Back to Matthew 24, verse 5. Jesus said, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And there has been a long list of false Christ. And over the centuries, there's always been a crazy person here or there that's claimed to be Jesus. But in recent decades, uh, it's, it's become more and more frequent, it seems. I want to back up just a few decades, and then we'll bring ourselves to the future. If you go back to the 1950s, I don't know if uh, 50, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, he was a Korean preacher by the name of Sun Young Moon. He started the Unification Church, and he called himself the Reverend Moon. He claimed to be the second coming of Jesus. He, uh, he said this, he, he said, he, referring to God, is living in me. He said, I am the incarnation of himself. He said that of himself, this man. Jump forward to 1969, a face you'll be very familiar with, a creepy guy, Charles Manson. He managed to convince a group of young people in California to murder the actress Sharon Tate and others in cold-blooded murder. He claimed this relationship with Jesus, being the, 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 the Savior. 1970s, you come down to Jim Jones from the People's Temple, started out over in San Francisco, eventually moved his followers to Jonestown. When the government wanted to fly in and inspect, and inspect what was going on there in his compound, he convinced the whole group to drink cyanide lace Kool-Aid, and they all killed themselves. 
Come to the 1990s, you might have heard over in Waco, Texas, a guy by the name of David Koresh. His actual name was Vernon Howell. He changed his name to David Koresh. He picked David after the King David in the Bible, and Koresh, which is another way of saying Cyrus, who is the Persian general we talked about last night, who took over Babylon. And so, anyway, Koresh believed that he was another coming of Jesus. And so there's been this proliferation of these false Christs, and there are more of them out there even now. But it's a sign that Jesus is about to come. Look in Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7. It says, you will hear of wars, Jesus speaking again, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Now, we have always had war, there's nothing new to that, it is a tragic part of the, uh, of being, of the human condition. But Jesus predicted this dramatic increase in war just before he comes. And I don't know whether you know, I'm not going to get into a lot of statistics. In in some of the previous messages, I spent a whole message on just these signs. And I can give you sign after sign after sign. Uh, But here, just currently, in the 20th century alone, over 200 million people have died as a result of war. And I believe that is more than all other previous centuries combined. We've always had war, but like I said, in the last century, we become really good at it. If you'll think back in history, we kind of used to line up in two straight lines, and we'd charge each other with swords and spears, right? And then they got to the point where they kind of line up and they'd shoot each other with rifles. Not like that anymore. We've gotten very sophisticated. We've gotten long range. We've gotten very deadly. And of course, right now, there's the war going over in, in Ukraine We could be on the verge of another world war. Who knows? Matthew 24, verse 7. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. You know, there there are three things that Jesus tells us to watch out for. Famine, pestilence, and earthquake. Let's start at the top of the list with famine. You know, there are um, millions and millions of people across this world that that are starving to death. In sub-Saharan Africa, you can see on the screen there, there are more than 28 million people there who don't have enough food. And, you, and, and honestly, there's enough food on this planet to go around to feed everyone. But in spite of that, the sad statistic is a child dies of starvation somewhere every six seconds of starvation. So one more sign that Jesus is about to come. He mentions pestilence. What is a pestilence? Well, it's like a strange, it's a di- strange disease. Think about the last few years, and I'm not going to get into all those things. But we, we've, we might have conquered polio and smallpox, but we're still losing the war. I mean, we've got SARS and West Nile virus and mad cow disease and swine flu, and now we've got COVID-19. So is there pestilence today? Yes, there is. In spite of all the medical advances that we have, we, we, uh, you know, we're still losing the battle. And we're not even going to talk about tonight the, the strange things that's taking place with our weather, with droughts and floods and everything else, and the, the, the way the bees are dying. There's so many more things that we could look at. Um, as far as the, the earthquakes go, again, I'm not going to break down the statistics for you, but statistically, uh, briefly, we've had more major earthquakes, uh, high, seven or higher on the Richter scale, in the 21st century than any other time in recorded history. That's how it is. That's how much it's increased recently. So the signs are being fulfilled. I believe Jesus is about to come. So we need to be very careful, brothers and sisters, that we're not deceived. You know, before we think any more about his second coming, I want to back up to the first coming and think about that for a minute. The people of Jesus' day had the same Bible that you and I have. They had the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament, of course. But they had the same Old Testament, so to speak, that we have. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament dealing with the first coming of Jesus. And yet, somehow, the people of God, with the Bible, so to speak, in their hands, they missed the first coming of Jesus. How could that possibly happen? I believe the answer is, is at least twofold. One, I think, is the people didn't read the Scriptures for themselves. That's why I keep telling you, 
Read it for yourself. Study it for yourself. I don't think the people were studying it for themselves. Most of them didn't have access to it like we do. And the second reason I think that, that they, they missed the first coming of Jesus with the Bible in their hand was because the religious leaders of the day had created a theory about the first coming of the Messiah that sounded really good, but hear me on this, it was not biblical. The theory they had was that when the Messiah came, he would come as a conquering king. They were confusing the first and second comings. They thought he would be coming as a conquering king that would deliver Israel from the Romans. It sounded good. They even had a few scriptures they could kind of twist and turn and look at it in different angles and make them sound that way. And it's very interesting to me, brothers and sisters, because history often repeats itself. And with those things said, as hard as the devil worked at deceiving uh, God's people about the first coming of Jesus, don't you think he would double his, his efforts to confuse us about the second coming? Look in verse 23 through 25. <clears throat> Jesus said, Then if anyone says to you, Lo, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. Verse 24, For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And notice what he said. Jesus said, see, I told you beforehand. He said, I'm telling you now so you don't have to fall for this. Let me ask you, who are the elect? Who do you think that is referring to? It's God's people. The elect are God's people. Uh, So Jesus is warning his people. He says, if you're not very careful, he says, even you who are believers are going to be deceived. He also added, look, I'm warning you ahead of time. There's no reason for you to be deceived. Look in verse 26. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So there's two things that I want to point out. Jesus said if people say to you, uh, he's here, he's there, don't believe it. When Jim Jones came and said, I am the, the incarnation of Jesus, or Sun Young Moon, or any of these people, or David Koresh, I'm the Lamb of God, follow me, don't do it. Don't do it. And the second thing is, Jesus warns about a false teaching about these inner rooms, and the King James Version calls it secret chambers. Take note of that. Take note of that. He says, behold, he is in the inner rooms, like I said to King James, he is in the secret chambers. Jesus says, believe it what? Not. Let that sink in for a second. Now I'm going to go to a topic that may hit close to home to many people, and I just want to look at what the Bible has to say about it. But first, let me, what kind of car do you drive, sir? Yes, sir. Dodge pickup, what color is it? White Dodge, okay. All right. Well, uh, if any of you don't like some of the conclusions that we come to at the end of this, if you want to let the air out of my tires, I, di- I drive a white Dodge pickup. You'll find it out in the parking lot. In the last 20 or 30 years, most popular religious movies and books that teach that Jesus is coming secretly, the one the most popular is the Left Behind series. But Jesus warns specifically, we just read, that when people say he's coming in the secret chambers to believe it what? Believe it not. He's saying that is not how I'm coming. Probably 95% of Christians today teach and believe that Jesus is coming secretly and quietly. Now, this was important enough to Jesus for that he specifically warned not to be deceived on that issue. And as always, what I want to do is I want to go to the Bible. Let's just see what the Bible has to say on this subject, okay? So to help clear this up, I first want to start with three facts about the manner of the coming of Jesus. And when we look at these things, it'll help clear this up. Number one, when Jesus returns, he's really going to return. It's literally going to be Jesus. There are people that say that the second coming of Christ is only symbolic. There are some who say it's when Jesus comes into your heart. That's the second coming of Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible says at all. The language is very obvious. It's a literal return by literal Jesus. In fact, you can look in Acts chapter 1 with me. Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and verse 11, page 754 in those Bibles. 
It says, and while they looked steadfastly, this is talking about the disciples, and when Jesus was ascending to heaven there after, he, uh, after his resurrection, he came back to the earth, he's ascending now. He says, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, these were angels, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So he's coming down, the Bible says, the very same Jesus who went up into heavens is the same Jesus who's going to come back in the same manner, literally, physically, uh, he ascended into heaven, literally, physically, he's going to descend back to this earth. So that's the first item on the list. Jesus will literally return, not symbolically. He's going to not just be coming in a spiritual sense. It's really going to be him. Point number two is this. When Jesus comes, you're going to see it. And you're going to see it with your own eyes. How do I know that? Remember, the disciples, it says they watched him go up, which it means that I'll watch him come down. And notice what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. It's page 851. It says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and how many eyes will see him? Every eye. Every eye. When Jesus comes, everybody's going to see it. Everybody. Listen to the words of Jesus himself over in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. He says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and notice, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So let me ask you, what kind of person doesn't want Jesus to come? It's, and I'm going to answer the question for you. It's the person who has kept putting off that relationship with Jesus until it was too late. When Jesus comes, everybody sees it. The people who are ready see it, the people who are not ready are going to see it. You're not going to have to turn on CNN or Fox or, or whatever, any kind of cable or your phone to see the second coming of Jesus. You don't have to check Facebook or Twitter. When Jesus comes, you're going to see it for yourself. In fact, the Bible says it's going to be so visible, it's going to be like lightning. Notice what it says in Matthew 24, verse 27. It says, For the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Nobody misses lightning, right? I mean, uh, if you can't see it, you can hear it. But, but if you can't hear it, you can feel it. You can close your eyes and you still see lightning flash, right? There's this charge in the air. So let me ask you a question then that, that to, will tie in logically with this whole idea that we're thinking about. What if I were to tell you that only the Christians were able to see it? Would you believe me? The language of the Bible is unmistakable. When Jesus comes, everybody sees it. Friends, the devil has a counterfeit for everything that God has. But one thing he cannot duplicate is the manner of Jesus' coming. He will not and cannot come in the clouds of heaven. He cannot come like eat, uh, lightning from the east to the west. And so with just that one text there in mind, uh, we, we don't have to be deceived by the, the second coming of Jesus. I mean, or, or Satan trying to deceive us. Jesus will be coming in the clouds with all the holy angels. Satan cannot duplicate that. That's why the devil, if you think about it, has to come up with a clever way to fool all of Christianity with a secret coming of Jesus. Because he, he wants us to be deceived. But you might say, well, I heard this theory it says that, well, I know, I've heard the theory too. But right now, what we want to do is deal with only facts from the Bible. And the Bible says unequivocally that when Jesus comes, every eye will see him. So here's what we know. Jesus will come literally. Uh, it will really be him. And second, when it happens, we're all going to see him. And point number three is this. Uh, when Jesus comes, we're going to hear him. Again, how do I know that? Listen to how Jesus describes the return, Matthew 24, verse 31. <clears throat> and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So it's going to be really visible. It's going to be really loud. How loud? It's going to be loud enough to wake the dead. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Notice that. 
a shout when Jesus comes, with the voice of the archangel when Jesus comes, and with the trumpet of God when Jesus comes. It says, and the dead will rise first. So when Jesus comes, he returns with a shout. It's going to be so loud, the dead will come back to life. In fact, in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, it's, uh, John says, Don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming who are, uh, when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Continuing on, verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So when Jesus comes, brothers and sisters, there's going to be a huge commotion. If God yells, it says the voice of God, don't you think you would hear it? If, if the trumpet of God is sounded all over the planet, don't you think you would hear it? If the dead start popping out of their graves, don't you think you would notice that? Nobody is going to miss the second coming of Jesus. It's going to be the biggest commotion, of the grandest event that this earth has ever experienced. Matthew 16, verse 27, notice this. It says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, then He will reward each according to His works. Notice this. When Jesus comes, He gives out His rewards. And that's because the judgment is already finished. It happens before the second coming. We're going to be talking about this on July 22nd. I think it's coming Wednesday, uh, next Friday night, I think it is. So when Jesus comes, though... Just keep this in mind. Everything is final. There's no chance to change your mind. You've already decided your reward is already going to be given. So when Jesus comes, every eye will see him. When Jesus comes, every ear will hear him. When Jesus comes, it's going to be the most spectacular event that's ever occurred on this planet. It's going to be that stone crushing that statue that we saw. It's going to be the kingdom of God replacing every human kingdom, and it will be final. There will be no more chances. When Jesus comes, there are only two groups, those who are ready and those who are not. But there are a lot of theories, brothers and sisters, about the second coming of Jesus. But remember, Jesus was very specific in telling us, don't be deceived in relation to my second coming. But in the last hundred years or so, one of those theories has risen to the top and become really popular. And that theory kind of looks like this. It says that at some point in history, Jesus is going to come for his people. He's going to take the believers back to heaven secretly. He's going to leave everybody else behind. And then at the end of this seven-year tribulation period, Jesus is going to come back again, this time with the believers, and this is when he's going to set up his kingdom. Now, there are some variations on that. There are a few variations. There's no need or reason to get into all those things. But the, in general terms, this is what the most popular theory in modern Christianity looks like. And the question that I have for this theory is, is it biblically accurate? We need to be asking questions about the things that we believe. That's why, again, I've been encouraging you to make sure what you hear from me and anyone else is from the Bible. I don't want to be deceived, and I certainly, I can assure you, I don't want to deceive anybody. That's the last thing I want on my conscience when Jesus comes. So, question about the biblical soundness of the, this most popular theory of the second coming of Jesus is one that Dr. Uh, Roland Bingham had. He was, used to be the editor of Christianity Today, and... Uh, he tells a story about he was working on his sermon one Saturday night. He was going to be speaking on Sunday morning. He was working on his sermon that Saturday night, and his wife came into his study, and she asked him a question. He said, you know, I'm going to be teaching Sunday school in the morning, and we're going to be talking about the second coming of Christ. And she said, I'm looking for that verse. I can't find it, that, that where it says that Jesus comes back, and he secretly steals away all the believers. Can you tell me where it is? Well, that's easy, he said. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So she went away. She was happy. She went and she opened up a Bible. She began to read. And this is what it says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, that didn't seem right when she read that. So she went back into her husband and said, Honey, that, that, that might be the noisiest verse in the Bible. Now listen to what I quote Dr. Roland Bingham said, the ex-editor of Christianity Today, in desperation, in sheer desperation, I took out my Bible and I threw myself 
helplessly on the Lord. The weeks that followed that innocent query and the trouble into which it landed me is a separate story. Now listen carefully what he says. He says, if you hold the theory of a secret rapture of the church, try out that simple question on yourself. You know what the question is? Where is it at in the Bible? I think it's a valid question. All my life, I've heard about a secret coming of Jesus. And if it's factual, we should be able to find it in the Bible, right? Let's look briefly at the word rapture. The word rapture is one of those words that's actually not found in the Bible. There are other, some other Christian terms uh, like Trinity and Millennium. You don't find those in the Bible. We find those ideas in the Bible, but you don't find that word in the Bible. The word rapture actually means a catching up or a snatching away. The word is not found in the Bible, uh, but, but the ideas. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, we read it a minute ago. It says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So caught up was translated from the Greek into the Latin, the word rapier, which translates into the English as the word rapture. So that's where we get the word from. So it's a legitimate word. There's nothing wrong with the word. But you may have a question in your mind. Well, I read a book or I watched a movie called Left Behind or I saw this series and it doesn't sound like what we've been reading here the last few minutes from the Bible. You know, I've been taught that when Jesus comes, a rapture is going to be a secret one and when, then there's going to be this tribulation that's going to occur. Now, let me, let me ask you, from the text we've been reading, is there any reason so far that we could find that this one might be a secret somehow? You tell me. Yes or no? From the text we've been reading, it's the noisiest, most visible, most glorious event that will ever occur on this planet. And I want you to think about it like this too. Do you think that God is going to allow His precious Son, who was tortured and humiliated and, and killed by those He sent to save, come back in a secret little whimper? No. He's going to come back gloriously. Gloriously. So where do we get this idea of a secret rapture? Remember, Jesus warned us. He says, if they say he's in the secret chambers, believe it what? Believe it not. My friends, there's a perfect, this is a perfect parallel to the time of the first coming of Jesus. There's a popular teaching that everybody liked back then. It sounded good. And that teaching deceived almost every religious person of Jesus' day. They did not expect it. The majority of them did not see his first coming coming. The foundation of the rapture theory was laid over 400 years ago based on specific orders of the Roman Catholic Church. No offense to them. It was, des- it was designed to neutralize the effects of the Reformation. When Luther, and we'll talk about him on another night, maybe some tomorrow night actually, <clears throat> And another night, but when Luther and the other reformers started preaching, as you know they did, against some of the teachings of the Catholic Church, he was a, you know, as you know, he was a, a Roman Catholic priest, and he began to teach against the Catholic Church. People started leaving that church, the Roman Church, by the droves. And we're going to come back to this before the night's over, but right now I want you to see that there are three primary schools of thought concerning Bible prophecy. Three of them. One of them is the preterist view. That teaches that, uh, and this is a a, a simplified definition. I'm simplifying this. But it teaches that, the preterist view teaches this, that the the things we find in Revelation and prophecy basically took place somewhere in the past. They're already done. They're already taken care of. They took place during the the time of the prophet John or, or whoever. Then there's the historicist view of Bible prophecy. It teaches that the prophecies... Uh, they began in the time in the past, and they often they extend, they go through into the future. Some of them have already come to an end, but some of them are still going on or will continue going into the future. And there's the futurist version, the futurist view of prophecy, and that basically says that everything in Revelation is going to happen sometime in the future, mostly, again, simplification, during those seven years that they say it will happen during the tribulation. And we're going to come back to these. I just want you to be aware of them. I haven't tucked away in your head right now. But there are three absolutes. I want to cover those three one more time. When Jesus comes, he's going to come back the way he went. 
It's really going to be Him. When He comes, every eye is going to see Him, according to the Scriptures. When He comes, everybody's going to hear Him. It's going to be very audible. And so if you look at this carefully, you cannot find a secret coming of Jesus here anywhere. He's not going to come quietly for the righteous and publicly for the wicked. He just comes once for both groups. And Jesus said it will happen like it did during the flood. Notice this in Matthew 24 again. Matthew 24 Verse 38 and 39 says, For as in the, in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the flood, or excuse me, entered the ark, and didn't know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So here's the question. Did the righteous and the wicked experience the flood together? Yes, they did. You can look at the cover from the Bible from cover to cover, and I have, and you cannot find Jesus coming secretly for believers before, and and uh, and and it's just not there. So you can search it for yourselves, uh, but it is important for us to understand what the Bible does teach. You know, there's some other questions we can start to ask. Well, when does the the Antichrist appear? You know, according to the most popular theory. Uh, Today, the Antichrist makes his appearance. He comes after Jesus comes for the church secretly. Then the Antichrist appears. Some say three and a half years after this trip, in the end of this tribulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll cover that next Friday night. We'll make that a lot clearer. But the point is, they say it happens sometimes during this seven year tribulation. And it seems to make sense, except for there's one small problem. Paul says that the Antichrist comes before Jesus comes from the church. When Paul wrote his first letter to the Thessalonican church, they got so excited about the description that Paul gave of the second coming, they started assuming it's going to happen any minute now. And so Paul wrote another letter, what we call 2 Thessalonians. He began to explain that he said there's a few more things that's going to happen before the second coming of Jesus. Notice with me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And our gathering together to him, we asked you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all this call God, or that is worshipped, and so that he sits in, as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Next Saturday night, be here. First session, the coming of the lawless one. We're going to see about this next Saturday night. But the point here is Paul is making, he couldn't be any clearer. He says Jesus will not come, he will not appear until after the Antichrist appears. There's no mistaking this, but it doesn't fit the popular theory. The Bible teaches that the Antichrist is actually going to be destroyed by the brightness of the coming of Jesus. And it's still in the context of Jesus coming for His church. In verse 8 of the same chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of His mouth, and destroy with the brightness of His coming. And we don't have time to get into that, but the, the glory, the, the power, the, 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 the majesty of God will destroy all sin and sinners when He comes. And this is what's saying is going to happen. So when Jesus comes for the church, this wicked one, this Antichrist power is destroyed. And the story of this planet as we know it and understand it now is finished. There are no second chances. There is no seven-year period of time to get it right with Jesus. We will be uh, looking at this seven-year period again, like I said, next Friday night it is. But in this theory, in this uh, of the secret rapture, uh, there is this second chance, supposedly. During that seven years after Jesus comes, Jesus comes, He raptures secretly away the church, uh, and then all of a sudden uh, those lost folks, they realize, wait, Where's my saved wife or my saved husband or my preacher or, or whatever it is? And they realize the Christians are gone. They're left. They have seven years to get it right with Jesus. That's what that theory teaches. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It's a popular theory, but it's not in the Scriptures. And that, brothers and sisters, should raise some red flags. Revelation 22, verse 11 and 12. Jesus said this about His second coming. 
He was un- unjust. This is when Jesus comes, this kind of a pronouncement that's made. He was unjust, let him be unjust still. He, is, he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. When Jesus comes, brothers and sisters, it's over. No second chances, no makeup exams, because when Jesus comes, decisions are final and his rewards are with him at that time. But the most popular theory in Christian world tonight is not in the Bible. So let me propose a more biblical scenario. According to the plain facts that we find in the scriptures, um, at some point in history, the Antichrist will appear. We'll find out that tomorrow night. The Antichrist appears, and then at some point, Jesus will return in glory for the believers. These are the undisputed facts from the Bible. And for the first 1,800 years of Christianity, nobody believed in a secret second coming. It's not like this is what the church has always believed. 1,800 years, this was not believed. This was not an idea even out there. Say, well, what about those verses that say Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night? Does the Bible teach that? Yes, it does. Let's go there. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. There's a couple of them. This is just the one we'll look at for now. It says, but of the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night. So does the Bible say that Jesus will come like a thief in the night? Yes, it does. It says it right there, Right? But does that mean that he will come quietly and secretly? Let's read the rest of the verse. I'm going to put the rest of the verse on the screen now. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a what? A great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. This is the noisiest verse in the Bible. A great noise, fervent heat, heavens passing away, elements melting. How could that be a secret to anyone? The second part of the verse totally does away with the secret rapture theory. So We have to let the Bible explain itself. That was our first principle last night. Look at another text with me. Matthew 24, verse 42. It says, Watch therefore, for you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. The point is this, brothers and sisters, the timing is secret, the event is not. We don't know exactly when it's going to come. We can know it's very near. All the signs point to that undeniably. It's coming is very near. But the the timing is secret, but the event will not be secret at all. Here's another text. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. And by the way, I don't exhaust all the texts that I have from up here. I save a whole ammunition of them if I need them. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 through 5. For you yourselves know perfectly... That the day of the Lord, that's referring to the coming of Jesus, so comes as a thief in the night. There it is again. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. Notice that. So that this day, notice day is capitalized, should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. The references to Christ coming as a thief is the timing of his coming, not the manner of his coming. It's a surprise to those who are not ready. It's a surprise to those who don't know Jesus. It's a surprise to those who are not watching and expectantly looking for that blessed hope. That's who will be surprised. There's another text that other people use. You've heard of the one taken, the other left. Go with me to Luke chapter 17. This is listed in some of the other Gospels as well, but Luke, I think, is the clearest. Luke chapter 17, verse 34 through 36. Jesus said this, I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, the other left. 
Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken, the other left. So this text says that when Jesus comes, some will be taken, some will be left. But does it say anything about being a secret, yes or no? No. Back up to verse 26. We always want to read the context of a passage. A text without a, uh, with a context is a pretext. Back up to verse 26. See what he says. In 27, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus says, remember that when I come, it's going to be like the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, there were some that were taken, there were some that were left, there were some that were saved in the ark, there were some that were left for destruction. That's all it means. He draws another parallel in verse 28 and 29. He says, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. If you remember the story, I won't get into it. Lot and his daughters eventually were saved. You know, his wife was turned into a pillar of salt. And the rest of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. There were two groups and only two groups. Those that were saved and those that were lost. There was no secret whatsoever. Luke 17 verse 30. Even so, Jesus said, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus is simply saying that when He comes, there are going to be two classes. There are going to be those who are saved. There are going to be those who are lost. That's all He's saying. This passage says nothing about a secret anywhere. Look in verse 31 and following, in the light of what we've been studying. In that day, he was on the housetop, and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. We just talked about her. Verse 33, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, the other left. We're reading the context now. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. That sounds kind of strange. He says, Where are these people going to be? He's basically, they're saying, where are those who are left going to be? He says, wherever you see the eagles gathered together, that's where they're going to be. What does that mean? It's not complicated. Often we overcomplicate things from the scriptures. The word that eagle that's used here is it's a Greek word for a bird of prey, a flesh-eating bird. It can be referring to a, to a bird like an eagle or a buzzard. The point is this is that the one will be taken to heaven alive with Jesus to be a guest of honor at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the one will be left dead for the great feast of the fowls. That's all it's saying. Two groups, saved and lost, no secret rapture. We find this also in the book of Revelation. And I'm going to tie something in together. This is one of those, I hope it's going to be one of those aha moments for you. It's like, boom, the light's going to come on when you see what we're about to read. Revelation chapter 19 Verse 17 and 18. <clears throat> this is John, the disciple John, by the way. He says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great." This is that gathering of the eagles or the birds of prey that we talked about in Luke. Here in Revelation is referred to as the supper of the great God. It's simply what's left over with all the dead people. They're left for prey for the birds of prey here. They're left for food. So the saved people are in heaven uh, and those left on earth are food for the buzzards. They're not enjoying a seven-year chance or second chance at salvation. So to me, it's like, doesn't it start to come together, start to make sense? And there's so many more things we're going to be looking at like this. Lights are going to be popping on in your head. The pictures get brighter and brighter and brighter as we keep looking at things from the Scriptures. 
There's so much man-made confusion about the Bible. And, and, but it all comes to light when we let the Bible interpret itself. Neither of the two verses that the secret rapture proponents, so to speak, use have anything to do with it being a secret. In fact, the opposite is true. And here we go. There are at least two dangers in believing that way. One, the people that believe this way will be totally deceived because they think they're going to be raptured away before the tribulation occurs and the Antichrist comes. They think, I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Some of the stuff we're going to be talking about some of the coming nights. I don't need to worry about that because I'm going to be raptured away. If you think that, that's not true. I hate to say it. The second danger is this, is it gives you a false sense of security because you believe, if you believe that way, that if I haven't made it right with Jesus, I'll just keep living the way I want to until those folks are raptured away. Then I know i got seven more years to, to give up my drinking and put away my pot or whatever it is that we're doing and try and get it right with Jesus. So you have a false sense of security if you believe that way. Let me tell you. I've got a little brochure, it's called The Country Perspective. <clears throat> I don't know how many years ago it was, I was, uh, I was actually in Purvis, Mississippi, and I'm a cyclist, and I was riding a bike in Purvis, Mississippi, out in the countryside, and I was, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of fence posts back there, and, and, and a lot of fence in, back there in, in Mississippi, in the, in the country, out there in Purvis, and so, anyway, on one of those posts, there was a little box, and on that box, on that fence post, there was a bunch of these things that you see a picture of on the screen. I've had this thing for 15, 20, how many ever years I've had it now? But this was in there. It's called The Country Perspective. Now let me, let me read just a couple of things. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. I just want to read a, a couple of little highlighted things. On the very front it says, listen, letter to those left behind sometime after the rapture. This was put on a, 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 a bunch of them on a post in the country for someone to find after the folks had been raptured away. That's nice of these people, I agree. Notice what it says. It says, Dear left behind person, I imagine you're very upset and confused about now. And by the way, well anyway, uh, you, you probably have friends or family who are missing. The rapture has happened. Jesus has taken his church, his body, his future bride. The missing people are okay there with Jesus. Now comes some bad news, it says. That is, the last seven years of this world age, known in the Bible as the tribulation, will start. How soon, we don't know. It may be within hours, it may be even a year or more. In case you don't know what this means, it means the worst times of anyone's imagination. In simple language, hell on earth. And it goes on, don't worship the image, don't take the mark, don't take the mark, etc., etc., etc. I can appreciate if there were some people that were concerned enough, that believed what they believed so much that they were put something together like that. I can appreciate that very much. But it's not true. Not true. The Bible refers to the term tribulation is used 23 times in the Bible but not one time, look at your Bible, will you find a seven-year tribulation listed. Zero time. The Bible in Daniel chapter 12, we, we, we read it last night beginning, uh, start, talks about a time of trouble such as never was, but nowhere does it say it's a seven-year period of time. And the idea of the seven-year period of time comes from a misunderstanding of the 70th week in a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 that we're going to look at next Friday night. By the way, it's the longest time prophecy in the Bible. It's already come to an end. But we're going to look at that next Friday night. Very interesting. Talks about the judgment, several things in there that people, it'll blow your mind. But a lot of Christians today have the idea that we're not going to be around during the tribulation period, but that idea, again, is not found in the scriptures. They, um, not, we're not going to be taken away before the plagues, but after the sixth plague is when God's people are delivered. And I have a whole sermon on the plagues that we, we won't have time to get into in this seminar. Notice Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Then the sixth angel, I'm one behind. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, 
and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings... Of, and by the way, there's so much... Uh, Things that tie in together here. In Daniel chapter 5, we talked about how the Cyrus went under the, 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 the river. He went under the river Euphrates. They dried it up. They went under the wall. Here we go again. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east. By the way, this was a part of that message I would have had the second message tonight that we obviously wouldn't have had time for. Might be prepared. Verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits uh, of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming, Jesus says, as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, we're keeping our eyes open, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Do you notice the coming of Jesus? And that's what this is refer- reference to. The second coming of Jesus. It's not until the sixth plague is poured out. Jesus' second coming is a part of the, the beginning of that seventh plague is what it is. Notice verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. This is when Jesus finally says, It's over. No more time on this earth, no more of this foolishness, no more of this pain, the heartache, all these things. It's done now. Just like from the cross, Jesus said, it's finished, it's done there. His earthly, his, his sacrificial ministry was complete at that point. Now he's saying that this heavenly ministry is done now. It's over, it's done, he says. I'm going to take my people to be with me now, as he promised in Re- uh, John chapter 14. So when... And where and why did people come up with all these ideas that we have? Just quickly, I want to share with you. It dates back to the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. As I mentioned before, it's when the Roman church, they were persecuting the Christians, and Christians were denied access to even having their own Bibles. And the priests told the common people what the Bible said and what it meant, and they had no choice but to go along with it because they didn't have it. They didn't have Bibles. They had no way of knowing. But what happened was the light of God's Word began to shine. First, it was a little here, and it was a little there. The Protestant Reformation began. The printing press was invented. And men like Martin Luther, who had been, that, been a Catholic priest, began to point out the teachings in his church. And people began to rally to the Scriptures because all of a sudden, they had access to the Bible, and the light began to shine. The lights began to come on. People who had been believing away so many years but not studying for themselves, all of a sudden, the light started popping on. And when the light of God's Word began to shine, it began to be here and there. And in response to these these messages by these reformers, the Roman church assigned these two Jesuit priests to develop some counter-interpretations because what happens was, was people began to leave the Roman church in the droves. And so the church said, we've got to prevent this. We're losing everyone. We've got to stop this somehow. And so they, they appointed these two uh, Jesuit priests to develop some counter-interpretations to go against the Reformation messages that would take the heat off the Catholic Church. One of them, his name was Alcazar of Seville. He applied all the beast prophecies that we're going to talk about tomorrow night to the Antiochus Epiphanes. I don't know if you've heard of him, but Antiochus Epiphanes could not have been who he was referring to because he lived long before the popes began to rule in Rome. This system of interpretation began, uh, was known as the Preterist School of Prophecy. I told you about that before. The other Jesuit priest, uh, uh, Francisco Ribera, invented a system that's known as the Futurist School of Interpretation. He taught that the Antichrist would be some religious leader that would appear near the end of time and continue in power for some three and a half years. And that's where we got these things. And what has happened over time, brothers and sisters, this was not known or taught in the Christian church for 1,800 years. This is relatively brand new in the last couple of hundred years. And so this second idea by Ribera was more successful. It began to take root in the 19th century when it suddenly made its way into mainstream Christianity more than 1,800 years after Jesus. Jesus didn't teach this. 
is Rabira's uh, papal interpretation that has been resurrected by modern evangelical Christians today. In the early 1800s, this futurist view of Ribera went through some refinements, it went through some additions, and it began to be espoused and taught by Protestant ministers. And through the, I don't know if you've heard of, ever heard of John Nelson Darby, but primarily through uh, his influence and some of his writings, that's when it really began to spread to the United States. And during the middle and the later part of the 19th century, uh, the biggest boost that this had, if you've ever heard of the Schofield Bible, Cyrus Schofield, he put these, these, this teaching, this futurist teaching, into the notes of his Bible. And thus it became immortalized in the Word of God to Protestant Christians today. How Lindsay. I thought I had the book with me. I thought I brought it from home. I laid it out on my desk in my office at home, at home I guess. But I looked for it this evening. I didn't have it. But this book of the late great planet Earth came out in the 70s. And he is the one that really espouses. He put it in mainstream through this book, the late great planet Earth. And most everything that Hal Lindsey said in this book has been disproven. He said the rapture would occur in 1981. He said the temple in Israel would be rebuilt in 1985 and 86. He said that Russia was the king of the north and Egypt was the king of the south. And most everything that he wrote about in his book that I just referred to has been proven false, and yet the majority of Christians today still use it as a guidebook for last day events. I say we ought to go by what the Bible says and nothing else. This Left Behind series now has almost immortalized this whole false teaching through the modern media of books and television and movies. And I know that the secret rapture is popular one, and I know there are probably many people here tonight that uh, have been believing this for years. I, I did myself. It's been popularized, it's been immortalized. As hard as it is to imagine, it doesn't make it true. Now, I'm not sharing this to disappoint anybody, to disturb anybody. I'm sharing this because I believe I have a responsibility to share what the Bible says. Like I said, I'm encouraging you to study for yourself. Study for yourself. Look at this. There, there's never been a more important time to know what you believe than right now. Because Jesus is about to come. The deceptions of Satan will be like we have never seen before. Like Jesus said, if possible, Satan is going to deceive the very elect. But the good news is that Jesus is about to come. That is very clear from the Scriptures. Um, now is not the time to be following a theory that's not found in the Bible. Now is the time to be following God's Word and getting ready to meet Jesus. As we close this evening, I, I have one thing I want to ask you. and if you would, I'm going to pray in just a minute, and then I'll, I'll just remain seated. I want to go over a couple of things. But if you just want to say to Jesus tonight... You know, I don't want to be deceived. I want to be ready when you come. If you would, just raise your hand with me as we pray. Lord, tonight I'm thankful so much for your word. I'm thankful that, Jesus, you are uh, the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm thankful that, Jesus, when we place our trust in you, that uh, we don't have anything to fear. And so I pray, Lord, as we, maybe this is a new idea to many people. I'm sure that it is. I just, and I, I know that learning new things can be difficult, but so I just pray that your spirit will be that balm in Gilead, that you will guide and direct us, that, Lord, we will be preparing to meet you, and that we can only do that, Lord, by your spirit. So please send us your spirit in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.